right, so I guess we'll uh, conclude in our last installment of um, what kids do to us and how do we cope. Um, so today we're going to talk about discipline and I want to leave time to kind of uh, field any questions or um, any things you might want to address or any uh, Rebecca or myself to address um, to you guys. Um, so how do you kind of define discipline? What is uh, like, what does discipline mean to you? How have you, how have you typically characterized discipline, either from your own life, growing up throughout your family, and into being a caregiver of a child? What is discipline? How do you define it? What does it look like? Discipline is what? So I think I've learned that discipline is supposed to involve sort of like teaching along with, you know, maybe correcting a situation. Um, but that's not necessarily been my experience, nor always my default. To me, discipline was that correction piece, but without the teaching piece. Um, yeah, that's very true. Um, I, I think you, I think you hit it right on the head there because we're so concerned, and we can get so concerned with just addressing the behavior and having there be <coughs> behavioral compliance <coughs> that it it completely misses the teaching moment, and so you might want to ad address the behavior in the short term, but the long term needs of that child go un unmet in terms of teaching them and instilling in them um, helpful consequences and, and internalizing and building their moral compass and reflection. So yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Um, you know, growing up there was, you know, you, you, you know my dad's like, so if you don't do this now, you know, he kind of menacing and all this. And you know, oh, I see you got a C on that report card. I'm just like, yeah, and, um, and and so it was kind of that scene as kid, kid as like I said earlier, kids are not moral agents. Kids don't have the ability to, to be responsible all the time. We don't have that ability to be responsible all the time, and much less our kids. And so yeah, discipline is um, primarily, at its best, used as a teaching tool, not as a punitive tool. Um, so, like I said, punishment might shut down the behavior in the short term, but uh, teaching offers skills that last a lifetime. And when we only address the behavior, and if we only focus on compliance, if only my child did this or said that or made these grades, what happens is our kid just may learn to hide their feelings, compartmentalize it, not share. Um, it might teach them that there are some things that they can't talk to us about that they can't come to us for. Um, so that's all, um, that's all good to keep in mind. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are the goals of, of discipline? Where, where, what do we want to accomplish when we, when we do have to engage in disciplining our child? And I think is, uh, number one is connecting with that child, and number two is cultivating resiliency in that child. So when you connect with your kid, um, I, I, I've heard a lot about, um, how you know kids have a, a behavior that they don't you know that really affects us and the parents are like they're just trying to get attention they just want they just want attention well of course they're entitled to attention they're entitled to your to your supervision they're entitled to your mind and your and your presence they're entitled to all of that so what that parent what that caregiver is really saying is they're asking for something that they're entitled to well, of course they are. And so the behavior is, is looked upon as, well, I'm not going to give it to them or her because they're just trying, this reinforces that behavior. But when a child is upset, when a child is having problems, when a child is acting out or misbehaving, that is when they need connection the most, not when we, they need the absence of connection the most. Um, and so it's not actually reinforcing the behavior so much as it is communicating to them that I'm going to show up for you even when the worst of times happen, whenever you feel at your worst, I'm going to show up for you, and I'm going to be there. I'm not going to back away from you. And so when we look at it in terms of kid, kids are manipulating us or they're just looking for attention, well, they are looking for attention, and I think that the, it's always helpful to be curious. In what context does this behavior seeking make sense? In what context does the way they're acting <clears throat> make sense to me? Um, and what things am I doing or in what ways am I communicating to them that would make it necessary to um, respond, for my child to respond to me in this way and in, 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 this, 
uh, with this behavior that is upsetting to all of us. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conversation that we're having with ourselves, it's a conversation that we're having with our kid, depending on their age, and it's this maintaining curiosity. And, and I think a part of being curious is, what am I doing to contribute to how my kid is, is engaging me? What am I doing or what is happening around them for them to feel that they need to connect with me in this way and not another way? And so it's a, you know, you could kind of, it could be a very humbling thing being a parent, being a caregiver, especially when you ask these questions and things don't become so simple and we become very threatened when we don't have ready answers. Um, and a lot of times going along with that are, is that children, because they crave your attention or want that connection, they will do anything to get it sometimes, which means they're gonna throw something, they're gonna yell, they're gonna get mad, and you, I, I do it too, get angry and then I yell, well guess what, I gave them attention, but I gave them negative attention, and it doesn't really matter if it was negative or positive because they got what they were wanting. So you have to kind of look at that in a different way, like how can I give them the positive attention and redirect that behavior instead of providing the negative attention because ultimately kids just want it whether it's positive or negative and 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 they'll take what they can get that's true i mean um and connecting with them also means listening to their experiences and you know uh eight or nine year olds not gonna be able to convince us so much of um of of what they you know they're not going to have this this solid argument that will be like oh that makes so much sense carry on but i think they need a place to be able to express themselves to be able to <clears throat> to understand that they can come to you with their point of view i remember so yesterday my my oldest um he had the refrigerator door open and i'm trying to get the youngest breakfast made and i'm really stressed out and frustrated and i said sawyer please just close the refrigerator and I kind of raised my voice, and he's 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 very sensitive. He has sensor, uh, He's very sensitive to loud sounds or to bright lights or to you know weird touches and textures. It makes eating really interesting. Um, and so I immediately like oh, I'm like okay Sawyer, I, I'm so sorry that I raised my voice at you, and I was frustrated. And Dad should have done differently. And he's like yeah Dad, I was just looking to see where the magnets were on the refrigerator door to see. You know how it closes and stays shut like that makes thank you for letting me know that makes that makes sense to me um, but had I just taken the time to say son w w what are you doing with the refrigerator door open he would have been able to have the space and the room and the opportunity to tell me well I'm looking to see how the mechanism works to how this stays shut where the magnets are I can't see the magnets are they inside of the of the plastic I mean where are the magnets and then we we're able to have it would have been a much better uh, interchange and experience for both of us but because my you know I got overwhelmed all I could do was I see my refrigerator my refrigerator door open I'm like okay please I just want compliance and so just little cases like that so creating spaces and opportunities for them to tell you what their experiences are to tell you what their um, um, what their train of thought is is, is invaluable to them and yeah we step in it a lot of times <laughs> We sure do, every day. Any questions so far, or anything come up that you want to discuss before I move on? Yeah. Um, I'm sure maybe this is, you'll be talking about this later, but I was thinking about how I almost feel like discipline at the younger age was easier, because I have older kids, and so now it's, they're, I've got them compliant. They follow the rules, they understand like this and this and this, where now it's starting to change, like um, not necessarily outright breaking a rule, but how do you discipline, i.e. teach and train them? Like that's kind of, I think, where we're at is teaching them like life skills and well, maybe no, we don't watch that show because it's not appropriate. <laughs> and so it's interesting how it's a new challenge for us learning how to change behaviors not because they're wrong, but they would lead to wrong things later. So I'm just, that's not really a question. It's just, I'm anxious. It's, a, it's confessional. Amen, yeah, it's, amen it's, sister. I'm just anxious to see if you're going that way. So, so, so if I understand, uh, if I understand the topic, it's, so you want to address a behavior that might, that might have a long-term 
consequence or affect them adversely long term. Sure. Yes. And and so Always. like whether that's becoming a Red Sox fan or whether that's right. um, <laughs> um, or an Astros because they cheat all the time. Stop. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> too soon. Too soon. No. Too soon. Yes, right? too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Threw my shoe at you. Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll let Rebecca fill that one. Shut, shut the camera off. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do have older kids, so I have a 13-year-old, and my son will be 11 in a couple of weeks. Great. So, um, I hear you. <laughs> it's difficult. It's yeah. hard. Um, and something happens about that age of 12, 13, where then all of a sudden they don't really want to hear from us. They want to hear from their friends. Mm -hmm. And so, not only are we battling like our child. <laughs> <laughs> and the yeah. discipline of that, but then we're kind of having to counteract what they're hearing out in the world, right. you know? And so I don't know that I have a good answer, which I know that doesn't really help, <laughs> but um, I think for me, what works with my daughter is that I just try to be a safe space for her. Yeah. Where, <laughs> kind of, like, I mean, it is. Because she'll say, well, I want to watch this TV show. And I'm like, oh, you know? And then, but I'm like, so what about this TV show do you like? You know, and I think a lot of it too is I have to go back to when I was a kid. Did I remember all of those little subtleties in the TV show? No, I didn't. Like I just liked it because of whatever reason. And so I, I think I have to kind of just judge that a little bit, meaning like have conversations with her. Like, why is this important to you? Okay, well, our family believes this. And so, you know, I don't want you to watch that because you're not old enough really to fully understand that show. That sort of thing. And it doesn't make it easy. I mean, there's times where she's like stomping off and slamming doors and, you know. <laughs> and in those cases, I'm like, all right, well, when you're ready to talk, right. <laughs> you'll come back. <laughs> Just take your space. Right. So, yeah. and, and I think in built into that, especially as they get older, the 12, 13 teenager range, um, you also have to inbuild in, in, in just their activities to make room for them to push against your boundaries and to, um, and to question authority and to question you and to question, I mean, I, I think it's great, like what Rebecca was talking about, like her kids, like, why? You know, well, tell, you know, explain to me your point of view. Mm -hmm. And as a parent, as a caregiver, that could be very threatening to us, but I think that that is, it is so important for a kid to be able to question things because that's how you get places in life. You don't go by the status quo. You question things. This is how inventions and medicines and breakthroughs and everything gets discovered is because we question things. Why does this work the way it works? And so I think that it's something that there's a balance between, yes, this is why, this is why we don't want you to do X, Y, or Z. And I understand that might make you mad or upset right now. And I hope when you know we can talk further about this. But I also appreciate you just asking me. I also appreciate you giving me a hard time and making me think about this. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And um, and so they may come back with another argument. And I mean, that could wear us down. That could come across to us as questioning authority, which is okay. Yeah. Um, but it's it's exhausting. But also, they have a need, especially as their brain, when they be, when they're young and elementary, their brain is under construction. When they become a teenager, their brain is under reconstruction on the top part of the brain. So they have a need to push against authority, to push against boundaries, to break rules. And I think that we should um, have a little bit extra built-in compassion for when that happens. That's kind of what their brain is dictating they do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's a balance that, that you find. This is why, I know you may be upset, but, um, but, but then challenge them, but come back with a different argument to help me have my needs and have my concerns met about this issue. You you come back and you tell me it. You know why mom, you know why dad, you know why grandma, grandpa, caregiver doesn't want you to do this. No, you come back and say why. You can, how I'm wrong, how it's unfair, and what I should do about it. So I put it back in their court and it becomes like this, this okay. And then their creative brain gets going and then you're really on a roller coaster ride. Did you have a question? Yeah, and maybe that touched on a little bit. Do you think it, so brains under construction, they're hot mess, and they're, do you oh, think yes. it's reasonable, so I hear, I hear the point about like allowing space for them to question and to push back a little bit, because they don't, you know, as nice as it is when my kids just do what I say right away, I don't want them to always do what everybody says right away, that would be a big problem in life. So I get that piece. Do you think it's reasonable to um, 
whatever, discipline, teach, train, the approach, because I, I certainly like, okay, push back, but I think there's a respectful way to push back, and so that's part of the process too. Or is it that, you know, during a certain age, they're not even capable of that, and asking them to learn how to push back respectfully is not, or not, not, not respectfully, but you know what I mean. Absolutely, I think it's important to teach them. Um, for us to assume that a, a child or a teenager would know how to do it is kind of unfair. You know, because their body becomes overwhelmed, especially if they're not getting what they want and they start, their brain gets flooded and they just start yelling. <laughs> so that's not good for anybody. So absolutely, I mean, there have been times where my daughter will get heated and I'm like, time out, you need to calm down, I need to calm down, yeah. let's come back in 15 minutes. And then I do come back in 15 minutes. Yeah, and correcting the behavior in the, in the heated moment is going to go nowhere. It's just going to right. escalate it. So it's let, right. the little person, let the big person or little person explode or whatever. Mm -hmm. We get angry and then take a break and come back. Yeah. Sure. Because they're not going to absorb it. Right. And, and there's um, so many times we're not, we're not aware of how we're coming across to another person. Even as adults, uh, we, we <clears throat> may come across in a completely confrontational way. Whereas in our head, we just are speaking loudly and we're very passionate about whatever it is we're talking about. And we, and we have no, no sense of anger, frustration, or you know, combativeness in our bodies. But the other person is experiencing it as, oh my gosh, this person's upset and wants to really go to war. And so I think with our kids, a lot of times they may not be aware of how they're coming across to us. They may not be aware of how their tone of voice is triggering us or um, is, is preventing us from listening to what they're really saying. I know that you know I'm, I'm a walking contradiction um, because also kids, the younger they are, they have more black and white thinking. It's really hard for them to think about motives and longitudinal you know, consequences of things. They're really black and white. They're really either or. And so they don't have a lot of gray area to which is where life is mostly lived to you know they're trying to figure that out and so the other day so i my son's putting together a robot and i'm like no wait we have to you know let's just slow it down and look at the instructions i mean we're both really excited about it so at the end of the day my uh, my son's like that i think we were fighting about how to, how to build the robot and, and and i and i looked at my son and i says and this is a great time i, I says Dad, I said, I'm so sorry you, you thought we were fighting. Dad was really excited, and Dad's voice can get loud. Dad, Dad comes from a loud family, and so a loud voice does not mean I'm angry. It can mean that I'm excited, and so we, we talk for like 20 minutes about, you know, loud voices. I show them videos of, see this family over things. They're, they're, they're talking loudly, but do they look, and do they, do they seem sad? Do they seem um, that they're not, you know, frustrated? No. I'm like, well... Same thing here, so I'm like, so we're building in the gray area and how to communicate. And so, um, not only for ourselves and how to communicate to them respectfully, but for them to, but hopefully for them to reflect back to us and communicate to us respectfully. But a lot of times we're just not aware of how we come across to another person. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. yeah, in the quieter moments when it's not the blow up moment? Please don't be angry when you say it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like I like to acknowledge how how my kids are gaining in their independence and gaining in their skills, so that they know that we're seeing that in them. Mm -hmm. You know, and when they do successfully navigate some things that you know we're like, oh, I don't know if they're going to navigate that very well, yeah. and they do. It's like we celebrate that, mm -hmm. so that so that when they need a correction in a, a few days, that you know, it's like, hey, you know, you're not making the same good choices that you made the other day. That's so powerful to validate for them. And what you're teaching your child is, I trust you enough to make the right decision. You gotta point, you gotta point that out to them. You, know, you do. You know, I'm letting you stay at home by yourself for <coughs> two hours. Mm -hmm. you, know, remind, you know, that's, that's my sign that mm -hmm. we trust you. So right. you, gotta, you gotta point it out to them. Yeah, and, and then when you do have to circle back, you know, those days and weeks, and, and there's a behavior that you need to correct, you've already built up such a, a big reservoir of, I've paid attention to all these good, positive things that you've been doing and all these behaviors that show resiliency, strength, and trust. I mean, so I've already built us up. So when I do come and say, 
hey, this is really this is really not an okay behavior, they're more prone to listen to you because you they know that you're also paying attention to the good. Because the only time that some people get attention is when when they involve themselves in behaviors that no one likes. You know? yeah, I'm just always I'm always been shocked about how my kids leave the door to go off on their day, and they it seems like their self esteem bank is pretty full, and by four thirty in the afternoon they come back amazingly depleted. And I'm like, how am I gonna fill you back up in four hours? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's uh, and and as parents, I I think that they um, I think that they learn that process to fill themselves up, but 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 then they get that they get that from you guys, um, and they just may, yeah being around people is exhausting. Maybe they could just be more introverted in that in that respect. <laughs> Um, it sounds like you're making a nice, safe place for them, Donna, because in between coming home and the next morning, you know, like you're making something good for them. And, and so when you're disciplining, there's, you know, there's the, the why, um, the what, and the how. And the why is, um, going back to maybe what I said earlier, why is my kid acting this way? You know, what context would make sense for my kid to act this way? Um, so another personal story from my life. Um, so the last few weeks, I've, my, my youngest has just been having all this nervous energy, like all this excitable energy and you know, separation anxiety and things like that that just are not a part of this kid. And so I was, I was scratching my head. And you know, he, get, he, you know, he got more agitated. He, he, he can't control himself as much as he's been able to. And I'm like, okay, I can't figure this out. None of this makes sense in the context in which I understand him. And so it was disclosed to me uh, this week that he had um, a near drowning experience that I wasn't aware of this past summer. And so I wasn't aware of it, but something must have got triggered, but I'm like, ah, now this behavior can make sense if it is that his body is carrying around in it the, the traumatic experience of almost dying. So. I've been able to engage him in a place where he is in a more accurate way that meets his needs, that addresses the issues. And so his behavior is greatly improved and has greatly, um, his body is able to calm down. And so when it is that if you just look at his behavior, if you're on the outside looking and you're like, oh, that kid has got no boundaries. That kid doesn't get consequences. Oh, that dad's pretty lax. Or, oh, maybe ADHD for that kid, or oppositional defiance. So you could have come across many explanations, but if you're only looking at the behavior, it's not telling you anything. It's only telling you there's something behind it. And so that's why I say dig deeper, find the context, find the cur be curious about what would be or make sense for my kid to act this way? What would make sense? What context would there have to be for my kid's behavior to be exhibiting these type of um, outbursts or symptoms or whatever? And so always ask the question, why? So why is my kid acting like this? And then what? What do I want to teach my child in this moment? What is it that I want him or her to learn? What lesson is important? Because so many times people give consequences that have nothing to do with what their kid just did. So that could mean, for example, like someone forgets their baseball bat for a ball game and they keep doing it over and over. And so we say, well, don't. So we say, okay, well, no TV for you that night. I mean, like, that TV and bait have nothing to do with each other, it has nothing to do with the behavior instead of saying maybe, well, for the, for the next five games, you're going to have to borrow someone's baseball bat until you can find your own. That's an appropriate consequence. It's a teaching moment. Um, oh, I saw that you were outside riding your bike without helmet, without, um, you, you know, without you know, the proper safety equipment, without a light on your bike or whatever. Or I saw you skateboarding or rollerblading in the driveway with no pads and and guards on just in case you fell because you're still learning how to get this done right and we don't want to... You don't want you to get injured. And so that means, so for the, next, for the next week, there will be a safety check before you walk out the door with your roller skates or your bike or anything like that. There's going to be a safety check. And so 
that's appropriate consequence that goes in line with what it is the behavior was and is. So make sure that the consequence is number one appropriate and has something to do with actually um, the behavior that's in question, but also make sure that the, that the discipline is absent of fear or pain. They're not supposed to have to experience fear or pain from their caregivers when you discipline them. Frustration, yes. Anger, yes. Fine, fair enough. But not, not frustration, but not pain and not, not fear. And then how, how am I gonna teach my kid this lesson? And so these are the things that you, um, that you think you strategize, you know, what, what consequences are appropriate. Um, so kids don't usually lash out at us because we're bad parents. They usually lash out because they don't have the capacities to regulate their emotions. Um, so they're not doing it to get to us. They're just doing it because that's the best way they know how to operate at the current moment. Um, and also, people discipline on autopilot. I'm guilty of this. So when we discipline on autopilot, like I, like I kind of alluded to earlier, it becomes more about us and less about what our kid has actually done. And then when we also are in autopilot mode, we tend to maybe express anger a bit more. It, our, our kid is no longer focused on their own behavior or their own contribution to things. They're now focused on their caregiver's anger. They're now focused on their caregiver's disapproval. They're now focused on their caregiver's overwhelmed state and anxiousness. And so when it becomes less about them and more about us, that's when discipline is not meeting its goal. That's when we are um, missing the mark in terms of that way. Because it should, be about, it should be about our child. It should be about that behavior. But it should not, become about, it should not be about, oh, they're really angry right now because that causes them to withdraw or become anxious themselves. And when they become anxious, they can't think about their behavior. They can't think about what they've done. And so it becomes, it becomes more imperative to know where you're coming from and to be intentional on how you discipline and to also work through your own, your own issues as well. That's a harder one to do. <laughs> yeah, because we bring with us how we were disciplined as, as kids and we bring with us a whole repertoire of understanding about what it means to be a parent and what it means to, to raise kids. And so, some, some, yeah, it's really difficult because everything's sticky from the past. It all kind of has this residue on us in, in some sense. It's like we've got, got Slimer. You know, it's like, oh, you're finding things. Oh, gosh, I, I don't want to be that way. Um, oh, look, here's another piece. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's so difficult to do, and it's, again, very humbling to do. And it's easy to yell. Right. It's, easy it's, to it's super easy to yell, mm -hmm. but it's way harder to say, take a breath, come back in two minutes, like, mm -hmm. get a, go away mm -hmm. from me right now, because <laughs> if I talk to you right now, I'm going to yell. <laughs> yeah. And then I need, I need to talk, talk to you about your behavior, or mm -hmm. you know, it's way harder to do that. Yeah, and, and it takes so much time, and it take, and, and our lives are already so busy, and we're already living according, we're always looking at our watches, we're always looking at our smartphones. I mean, so our lives are so busy and compact enough as it is that, uh, I, I mean, just even have time for yourselves. Because the more, the more compassion you're able to show for yourself, the more compassion you're able to show for your kid. And so that's a part of doing your own work and being aware of your own stuff is, is to be compassionate towards yourself, not to beat yourself up over it, but to be aware of it and to show compassion to yourself for it. And because the more compassionate that you are with yourself, you will always be able to be more compassionate to your child as a result of being that to yourself. It does, it does not the other way around. Um, it, it starts with you first. And I like this, simply because we're human, our capacity to handle ourselves is not stable and constant. We're not gonna be stable and constant. They're certainly not gonna be stable and constant. And you're just, um, so it's, it's okay to normalize bad days. It's okay to normalize them. It's important to normalize them. It's important for your kids to see you frustrated. It's important for your kids to see you um, angry. It's important for your kids to see you all these types of things and all these types of ways so that you can talk to them about it. Not so that they can just observe and just be left to their own interpretations, but that they get to observe and get an explanation, a commentary about it. it they need to see how you deal with it. They need to see how you experience it, and they need to know how you talk about it. They need to know how... 
um, especially as they get older, especially as they become teenagers. Um, you know, it's not easy being a teenager. You can, you start to experience um, a, a, a thing, I mean, you start to experience emotions even more intensely than a three-year-old does as a teenager. You get more intensity of emotions felt than you do when you're three. And so that's, that could be a very scary time. So they need to know how you, they need to know how to talk about depression. They need to know how to talk about loneliness. They need to know how it is that, um, you know, that, that those things are normal. And they, and they need to hear stories about you and your life. Because one of my, my kid always, Dad, tell me a story about you. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's, it's exhausting, but your kids do so much better when they have a history of you as their caregiver because it, it allows them to normalize their own feelings, to feel less isolated, and also to give a, um, have a vocabulary in which to be able to talk to, this, to people, to you, to, to other um, people and supports in their life. So it, it, it greatly shapes and sculpts the brain to say, okay, this, this doesn't feel very good, but you know what, I got a vocabulary for what depression looks like. I know how it affected mom, I know how it affected dad or grandma, I know what it's like to have a bad day. I know what it's like to be frustrated. I see my dad, I see my mom do that, but we talk about it and that's okay. So it's, it's important. Um, so questions on reflection. Um, the first question is, what is your parenting, uh, or what is your discipline philosophy? Um, do I have a discipline philosophy? Um, and if not, or if you do, what needs to change about that philosophy to better suit you and to better suit your child? It's important to know what you believe and why you believe it because your kid is going to demand that you tell it to them. <laughs> in one form or another, they're going, um, they're going to bump up against it, question it, and it's important to know and be able to define to them, this is how I, this is how I view discipline. This is how when you do something wrong, this is why I do the things I do. This is how I respond to you in the ways that I respond to you. For these reasons, for these concerns, um, this is the way of me showing love to you. And, it, and, and so they, they need to have that um, defined to them as well because, um, because they need to know how we think. It's important. Second question is, um, is what I'm doing working? Am I doing something over and over again? Is this this kind of, you know, are we just in some awful feedback loop of reality here? It's, um, is what you're doing working? Are you getting the results that you want? Is your kid getting the results that they want from this. Um, because a lot of parents, they just double down. I'm not doing this, this particular thing hard enough or intensely enough. And so they double down and then with even more uh, results that um, are characterized by either chaos or uh, rigidity and distance. I learned pretty early on that my daughter is an introvert and so timeouts for her are fun. Like she was like, you're gonna send me to my room, yes, you know, and she could go to her room and do her own thing. <laughs> so that was not effective. But what does work for her is, and she's a she enjoys a conversation. So <laughs> I'm introverted too. So we should just take timeouts together, right? We're a rock like, concert. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, but what does work for her is sitting and having a conversation and like talking through it. And why do you think that that made me upset? And what were you thinking? And not in a rude way, but like, what were you thinking? And sometimes it's, I don't know, or, oh, I should have done this instead. And so for us, that's the way that we can connect. My son is totally different. He doesn't want to sit and have a conversation. Um, in a typical boy fashion, he does not like eye contact, that that makes him uncomfortable. And so like, we'll go throw the football or do something else and kind of talk. Sometimes he will, sometimes he won't. But for him, timeouts are effective because he wants to be in the game. Like he wants to know what's happening. And so not so much anymore, but when he was younger, that was a, a parenting strategy that worked for us. So I guess my point is know that kids are different, as you probably know if you have multiple kids. And so what works with one may not work with the other. And what works now may not work in two years. And so <laughs> it's kind of a guessing game. Yeah. yeah. Go, your best going to Vegas. Just go to <laughs> Vegas, make bets. Um, definitely. Um, my kids are definitely different. Um, so do I feel good about what I'm doing? Do I feel good about what I'm doing in terms of as a, as a disciplinarian? I always think of a Christmas story. <laughs> where uh, where little Ralphie's helping his dad change the tire and he knocks the lug nuts out and he and he and he curses, 
And so his mom goes home and sticks a bar of soap in his mouth and um, to find out where he heard it from. And so at the end of, this, of the scene, she takes the soap and puts it in her own mouth. She's like, oh, God. And, and then she's like, oh, God. And so it's just like, I don't think she was very happy with, with what she was doing and what she had to, what she felt that she was being put in that place to do. And, and so I think that as parents, we have to ask ourselves, is, is you know, is this working? You know, do I feel good about this? Do I feel good about how I'm, I'm, I'm approaching this and, and, and everything? And so I think it's important that we feel good because when we feel good and when we feel confident about the place where we're coming from, that shows up to our kids. They show, that, that, that shows them that there's congruency, that there's continuity between what we feel and how we act, what our principles are, and what we think is important. And so when our kids see us um, act in a place of, I feel good about this. I know, I know that you may not feel good about this sometimes, but I, I feel good about how, how we are talking about discipline and how we're disciplining you. I think that gives us incredible credibility. That, that really does increase our credibility with them because they can't say, well, you don't even like it. How would you like it if? Well, actually, I, I would like it if, if you know, someone came to me compassionately and calmly and wanted to hear my side of things. So they, th that's not something they can resort to. Uh, so do my kids feel good about it? Um, and can they still feel good about themselves when we discipline them? So, so many times it's a balancing act because when we discipline a child, it's almost like they internalize. It's so easy for them to internalize things because it is black and white. If I've done something wrong or something bad, I am bad. And so it's important that we find a way that we connect with our kids and, and, and allow ourselves to discipline them in a way that still allows them to feel good about themselves and don't feel that, and that their self-worth isn't diminished because of it. But we want them to still be able to feel good about themselves at the end of the day. Um, we want them to know, you know, we want them to be able to look at the behavior as separate from <coughs> themselves and, and then be able to, you know, make, make reflections and adjustments as needed, as age appropriate. But we want them to feel good about themselves. Any discipline that, that is geared toward not making, to, to guilting and shaming them isn't, isn't going to, you know, it, it can damage their, their self-esteem that you were talking about. But we want to be able to, to tell them, hey, that, that really does what you said, what you did, that really hurts, that disappoints me in how you did that, but I still love you, let's talk about this. I wonder what's going on with you right now, because that's not typically like you. Is there something that dad or mom isn't aware of right now in your life? I mean, so it's, um, we want to be able to feel good about themselves at the end of the day and have a sense of fairness in the process. Um, and that's the part, as they get older, you want to kind of include them on discipline. One of the questions I like to ask parents and kids in session, mm -hmm. I look at the kid and I says, so what is, a, what is a fair thing for your mom or dad to expect from you? What is a fair consequence for them to give you for not performing in school or for not uh, keeping your word to be home at a certain time? What is a fair thing for your parents to do for you? Uh, what's a fair way for them to respond? And so that puts the kid in a, that's, that, that's a double bind. That's a rock in a hard place. Because they're going to have to tell and disclose what is fair to them and what they would can't really argue with about, about their behavior. So involving them in the conversation as they get older and about what, what's fair to them. What's unfair look like? When I, when I ask you to do this and you, and, and you don't and I, and I responded this way, what about that was unfair to you? Let them talk to you about fairness because that's what makes marriages work. That's what makes partnerships work. That's what makes friendships work. If you always are in relationships that you don't think are fair, you're not going to be very happy. And so I think it's important that we teach our kids in these disciplining moments um, what fairness looks like and involve them about, about things. Be open to hearing about what they think fairness looks like. And on a more basic level, mm -hmm. it puts you guys on the same page. You know, it's like, okay, I understand this is what my parents expect from me. As the parent, my kid, this is what you, is expected of you. Um, I was working with a family a couple weeks ago and it's three teenage boys and the two parents and their main issue is homework and grading and so in the conversation the parents like well we expect all A's and so I asked the boys like what do you expect out of school and the oldest was like well all A's and the middle one was like 
you know, bees are good. Like, I feel good about bees. <laughs> and then the little one was like, uh, see, like, that's where I am, you know? And so just having that conversation and the parents were like, oh, I didn't even realize, like, you're okay with this, even though we're wanting this. And so they're just constantly missing each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if your expectations, uh, ex you know, are, yeah, I know, have, have high expectations for your kid, but if your expectations are completely missing where your kid is developmentally, then, then that can cause a source of low self-esteem down here and self-judgment and frustration up here as you as a parent. Um, and so another, another good question to ask yourself is, how much does my approach resemble that of my own parents? Um, do I feel good about the messages I'm communicating to my kids? Um, and does my approach ever lead to my kids apologizing in a sincere manner? Um, that, that, that's important. We always wanna, and, and they learn that by watching us apologize in a sincere manner when we step in it. When we, when we lose it and we say something in, in anger or we say something that is not helpful, we say something that causes them to maybe be internalized and to feel bad about themselves. And so they learn how to apologize sincerely by watching us apologize to them sincerely. And, um, and so it's, it's, always, it's always incredibly important that, that we model that for them. Um, and I know that we have a, a, a few minutes okay, yeah, left, so like, um, anybody have any, any questions or any other comments that you would like to share? I think when you do it right, you understand your kid better, and they understand you better. And like, and I don't know how you, I, it's a very, uh, you hope you get to that genuine, we're a better team, uh, and I don't know exactly how you decipher we're back to okay versus we've achieved a genuine we're okay. <laughs> um, but hopefully you get more of the genuine okays than just the okay. The moment's over, we're back to okay. Yeah, and, and I think that's just with further conversation, like you just talk about it the next day. I, 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 think, I, I think just having these normal types of conversations built in about the argument that we had or the disagreement that we had the, the previous day is it, so, so helpful for us to not only hear what they have to say but also to correct any misinterpretations that they're carrying around with them. Like if, like I was able to help <coughs> my son correct, like I wasn't fighting him or being angry with him, I was excited about a robot. And I had my way, he had his way, and we're trying to convince each other of whose way is, is correct, but I wasn't fighting him in my mind, but he experienced. So it gives us an, a, a valuable opportunity to say, actually, no, that's not what I was thinking. That's not what I meant. I'm sorry if that's what you felt. That wasn't my intention. Um, so it, it kind of helps them expand it, this gray area of where life is lived, that there could be many, many opportunities and interpretations for um, a tone of voice or a facial expression or a way of doing things. And so it kind of broadens their world. So when they get, when, when they continue to grow, they're not continued on in that rigid black and white, you know, you're angry, you're not, loud voice means angry. Um, and, and so different things like that, yeah. And maybe I, I, I feel like it sounds like the middle school kind of years, it seems like in a good way and bad way, that gray area is expanding. Mm -hmm. And so, which just oh, makes even good, more good and more bad. Because in the past, like our son, it was very like black and white. But <coughs> and he is still, his personality is a pretty black and white. Like if you do this, then you do this. And I got that consequence. So she, so little sister, she gets yeah. that same consequence and fairness. And, and like, even with, laws and politics, you know, he's just trying to understand life and certain teachers say a certain thing, so he expects this result and we're trying to teach him. It's not always that way. Um, so he's grasping all that now, because now he's in eighth grade. And um, so the gray area is getting like really, really big, I think is what I feel like. But I'm trying, like, so then I think sometimes I'm like, well, it was just a little bit easier when it was just, no, we don't do that. <laughs> I don't have to explain it, do I? You know, so it's, it's interesting because you want that gray area to get bigger, but yet when you live in the same house as someone, you see you're like, oh, they're processing it. Um, I really want to influence how he's processing. Gray but, area against you, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. 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 
And, and, and here's and here's as a, the gray area as it benefits you as a caregiver of a, of a kid. The more gray area there is, by default, there's more mystery there. There's more or less ability to, to compartmentalize and to say either or. And so you as a parent, I think that we kind of feel pigeonholed sometimes. Like, like, like our kids look at us and they're like, yeah, we got you figured out. You're just no fun. Or, oh, you're just always <laughs> got, you're always on this soapbox. Or you always say no. Or you always do this. And so I think that as we, as we help them expand that gray area and we walk through them on that journey, I think that also <laughs> communicates to them that there's more to us just as a role of their parent. There's more to us than just this role. We are more of a mystery too. We, we're, we're not so easy to figure out either. And so we kind of invite our kids along that with us. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all a whiplash on that journey. But we also, the more gray area there is, the less, the less ability there is to, for judgment and, and, more, and more for acceptance. And that includes of themselves. So there's a lot of positivity to when that gray area expands the correlation to self-acceptance and acceptance of other people. Mm -hmm.